Great. Thank you all for coming here today. We really, really appreciate it. We hope you find this topic helpful and useful in the work that you do. Um, each of these monthly webinars that we're doing that we're doing this month is um, in the direct result of the input we've received from you in the field about the needs that you have and the educational topics that you're interested in. So today's topic is pertussis in the school setting, things to know for school nursing. Um, we are lucky enough to have here today with us Jessica Keller. Jessica is a surveillance epi with the Maine Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jessica. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, everyone. And let me see if I can successfully share my slides. Oh, it looks like it's disabled, maybe. Let me make you a co-host, Jess, just a moment. Okay, thank you. And you should be good to go. Awesome. share my whole screen it looks like which is fine let's see are you seeing the presentation now or are you we, seeing the zoom screen we are seeing zoom, zoom yeah that's what I thought. <laughs> let's try again um is it not showing up as a window Okay, we're just gonna go for the, the Zoom complications. <laughs> um, let's see. So as Sarah said, my name is Jessica Keller. I'm the Vaccine Preventable Disease Epidemiologist at Maine CDC. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about pertussis in the school settings and things to know for school nursing. Um, I'm really happy to talk to you about this today. And ooh, if I don't get ahead of myself, um, I really tried to keep in mind when creating this, um, things kind of that are behind the curtain when we're doing an outbreak that might not have already been communicated. So certain things that we may ask that you might not be prepared for, or that you didn't know we were gonna ask that you had no reason to be prepared for kind of thing, um, to make everyone feel as comfortable as possible in the event of a pertussis case in a school or an outbreak in a school. So with that, let's get started. And we should definitely have time at the end for questions. Um, plenty of time. So happy to take them at the end. All right. But first, let's get started with the etiology of pertussis, also known as whooping cough. Um, pertussis is very contagious. It's a respiratory illness, and it's caused by Bordetella pertussis. Um, this bacteria attaches to the cilia of the upper respiratory system, and once it's attached, it releases toxins, and these toxins damage the cilia, which causes the airway to swell, which then causes illness. Um, humans are the only known natural reservoir. Uh, the bacteria is transmitted through respiratory droplets, as we all know, and infected individuals are most infectious during the first phase of pertussis, which we'll talk about later. Um, and it can remain infectious for quite a long period of time, up to about five weeks if with no antibiotic treatment. All right, so signs and symptoms. Let's get to the timeline. So in that first stage of early symptoms, we typically expect it to last one to two weeks. And this would include coryza, low-grade fever, mild cough, and an infant sometimes apnea is seen, which is not all that common in older children. But that said, you might look at these and say, well, a lot of respiratory illnesses have um, those symptoms, which is very true, which is why we often don't catch pertussis, pertussis in those early stages, except for in 
outbreak situations or situations of close contacts. But so that brings us to stage two, which becomes more of the typical pertussis that we all think of when we think pertussis. And this lasts from one to six weeks, but can go as long as 10 weeks. Um, it includes the proxismal attacks that occur more frequently at night, typically long inspiratory effort, um, which leads to that high pitched whoop noise, cyanosis, which is also typically like apnea in infants um, and post vomiting. And so then we end with stage three, which is the convalescent stage. It lasts about two to three weeks um, in this phase it's common to, for individuals who are getting over illness to be susceptible to other respiratory infections. Um, it's a very gradual recovery with less persistent coughing that eventually disappears. So it's important to note that this timeline is not considering antibiotics. So with antibiotic treatment, the timeline, depending on when the antibiotics were administered, could get shortened. Um, but something that we'll call back to the last slide about the pertussis toxin is that although the treatment is effectively treating the bacteria, it's not treating the toxin, which is why illness, the treatment doesn't lead to immediate recovery or as quick of a recovery as we might expect with other illnesses. Okay. And to avoid trying to explain the WHOOP a bit more. We've gotten questions in the past of, well, what do you mean by WHOOP? And for, it seems that people either know it all too well or aren't super familiar with the noise. So I'm going to attempt to play you a clip. Um, I'll note this was from an infant immunization week video. So there will be other words that are coming across the, um, video, but that's not what we're primarily concerned about for this. I just really want to get across what that sound is that I'm talking about. So let's see. Right. And can I just get someone to come off mute and let me know if you actually heard that or if it was just me listening? We did. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, great. So I think helping, like hearing that can really just help confirm for people a question that we'll often ask um, is about like, do they have the characteristic whoop and if we're all not on the same page about what we're looking for, that can become a very complicated question. Um, so I hope that might be helpful going forward or in conversations that you might have. Um, I just find that very helpful to present, kind of set the expectation of what you are talking about when you're talking to about this whoop to others who might not know. Um, let's see if I can move forward instead of playing more. <laughs> Great, so questions we might have for you. Um, I am going to preface this slide with, I know this looks like a lot of questions because it is a lot of questions. And in all likelihood, you will not be asked all of these questions if you have an outbreak or a student with pertussis. However, when we're dealing with a pertussis case or a pertussis outbreak, we're getting information from different sources and depending on if we've been able to get in contact with those sources, like the provider, the parent or guardian of the case, it might leave us with you as the best option for getting information. So if we haven't been able to contact that other people, you will likely receive a lot of these questions, um, but also know that we don't expect you to magically know the answers to these, we're just hoping that you might and want to ask just in case you do know the answer. Um, and so some of them will more often be asked. And if you've had a pertussis case recently or an outbreak recently, you might be able to recall like, yes, I did get asked that. But if you're seeing questions and you're like, I've never been asked that or how would I know that? I mean, definitely let me know at the end if 
there are certain things that you're like, I would never, like in no world would I know that? Because that's helpful for us to know as well. But I just want to start with that. Um, these are definitely not expected answers, but more to prepare you to see these now and not feel the overwhelm later. So starting with, does this patient have a cough? Um, and if yes, do you know when the cough onset was or about how long it's been? Um, do they have paroxysms of coughing? Do they have the whoop, post-tested vomiting or apnea? Have they been exposed to anyone who is ill prior to their illness onset? So this would be, we would be concerned with at the school in this case, we're not expecting you to know about their other exposures here. Um, do they have any complications from pertussis or are they, are they hospitalized? Have you heard this from a parent or provider that we haven't heard from? Um, have they seen their medical provider? Uh, do you know if pertussis was diagnosed or if lab testing was done, if they did receive antibiotics? Are they vaccinated? That's one that um, school nurses uh, are always very reliable on, which we really, really, really appreciate because sometimes the information um, isn't in our systems, whether they're a newer student and new to Maine, um, and you all are always really reliable for that. So thank you for that. Um, are students in the same class all day or are they moving out throughout the school? So kind of what is your school situation? How does it work? Is there a daycare? Are they in the same area of the building or are they kind of excluded? Um, yeah, are people with one class or do they have multiple teachers and are with different classmates? Just kind of the basis of who we need to be worried about, how many people we think may have been exposed. Um, do you suspect other students also have pertussis? So um, although this one case, let's say, has been diagnosed, are you noticing that? Yeah, and a lot of kids are also having symptoms that seem like they probably have pertussis too. And depending on what the situation is, might be who these people are and what symptoms you are seeing. And if there are plans to see a provider or these aren't kids that are staying home from school and they're still in school, but you are seeing it. Um, are there any high-risk individuals? So when we're talking about this, we're talking about pregnant people who are in their third trimester, immunocompromised people um, who might be at high risk for severe pertussis and infants who are less than 12 months of age um, who may have been exposed. And then does the child participate in any school-related activities? Um, so where they may have been exposed. So this could be sharing a confined space for over an hour or having direct contact with respiratory or nasal secretions. So in school, we're thinking, or have they been somewhere where they would have shared water bottles? Have they had sports practice or any place they would have shared utensils? Um, and then just long-term kind of face-to-face -face exposure um, where they've been within three feet of each other. So something that I talked to our field epidemiolog epidemiologists about um, was specifically bus exposures. They find that that's often something that gets overlooked. And then if it was one case can quickly lead to an outbreak and it takes a bit to figure out, oh, all of these kids are on the same bus. It's not a classroom exposure. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind or other sort of atypical exposures that you might not think in the general course of your school day that um, the students might be, might be like cause for a student's exposure. Okay, so moving on from the long list of questions. Um, in let's like zoom back out and think about pertussis in the school in general. What What's your role when it comes to pertussis as far as like what can Maine CDC offer to you when you, you have a pertussis case? All of those things. So first and kind of most simply, just calling attention or even thinking pertussis, just being here today and being generally aware that pertussis happens is huge and we are so, so thankful for it. Um, 
because the reality is there are lots of respiratory diseases and often we see individuals go to a provider and pertussis wasn't thought about in the diagnosis at all, maybe until multiple visits have been made. Um, so if you're thinking pertussis and it gets mentioned when someone either calls out or you send a kid home from school because they're not doing well, it really helps that even the seed is planted in their mind in that they might bring it up to a provider, which can lead to earlier testing and then knowing about the case earlier, which could lead to preventing outbreaks in schools, which we really are trying to do. Um, and in just encouraging kids who are sick to see their primary care provider is a huge first step that we know you're doing all the time. Um, and then report cases of pertussis to Maine CDC. This can look very different depending on the circumstance. Um, so I'd say most often, this is a parent called in and said that their kid's positive for pertussis. It is so helpful when you give us a call and let us know that, hey, we have this kid, they were called out, they have pertussis. In theory, um, we already know about that case and we can say, hey, yep, we know about it, great, we'll be in contact if like once we know more and we can provide any information to you that you need at that point. But in some cases, we don't know about it at that point and you are the first point of notification. So that's when thinking back to those questions, we might have more questions for you because we haven't heard from anyone yet. Um, so we can get in touch with the provider and the case and get more information to then, again, help limit the spread and help with prophylaxis recommendations. Um, other situations might be you think, if you think that there's a lot going on here, we don't know, it might be a pertussis outbreak, it might be something else. It never, we're never gonna be mad that you called, essentially. It might not open up a investigation for us on our end, but we're here to help. So if you feel like, mm, this seems like it might be something, but I haven't heard like formally that there was a pertussis diagnosis. That's, if you feel like you need the help or want any guidance, any of that, we're here. Um, it also might be us contacting you. So that's not something you would have to worry about reporting, but just to say that um, there will be both directions, which we'll also get into next. Um, and then notifying parents and staff. So if there is a case of pertussis, we have template letters for you to use as you see fit and to edit as you see fit to send out to parents and staff to let everyone know what pertussis is, what they should be looking for, um, when they should see a doctor, et cetera. Um, we know that especially in uh, respiratory season, um, it can be complicated to explain to people that, well, there are lots of options of what this could be. And so we find that those letters are typically helpful in that navigating that situation. Um, excluding and readmitting, we'll get into exclusions a bit later, um, but just making sure that kids who had pertussis who shouldn't be at, at school aren't at school, and then making sure that you know when they can come back um, and aren't infectious anymore. Um, and encouraging and promoting testing, which brings us back to that first point. Um, also encouraging vaccination and keeping track of vaccination, which you all already do, um, and hand hygiene. All right, so back to that exclusion point that I was talking about. So we're gonna start on the left side of the screen. Uh, if a case is infectious, so if you have a student who has pertussis, um, and they have been coughing for less than 21 days, they should be excluded until they've taken antibiotics for five days. Or if they opt to not take antibiotics, 
um, they should be excluded for 21 days after that cough onset. And now moving to the right, if there's a close contact of this case, who is symptomatic and have been coughing for less than 21 days, then they should also be excluded until they complete a series of antibiotics or they receive a negative pertussis lab. Now, this can be a complicated, the second can be a complicated exclusion criteria because there are other respiratory viruses. So know that when we say symptomatic, we don't mean just a cough. Um, also, the expectation for pertussis isn't as um, rigid, I guess, as some other diseases like varicella, uh, for instance, where we might, that might be very clear exclusion. This might be more of you sent out the letter to the uh, parents and staff and you heard back, you got a call back that, yep, I'm bringing my kid to the doctor today because I think they have pertussis. Okay, great. Given that you think that based on this information, we're going to exclude them until we know that it's not pertussis. That's kind of the logic there. Um, I know that can be exclusions in general can be difficult to deal with. So we're always here to help navigate that situation as well if it gets to that point. Okay, that brings us to prophylaxis recommendations um, and which can also be quite complicated. So it's really a balance of, we wanna minimize the spread of pertussis, yes. And we also wanna ensure that high risk individuals who are at risk for severe pertussis are covered, are safe. Um, we're really reducing the risk of spread to them. And also we need to keep in mind antibiotic resistance and responsible use. So it's a bit like spinning plates, <laughs> um, but generally anyone who's exposed and is high risk of developing severe pertussis. So that's people we talked about before, pregnant people in the third trimester, infants less than 12 months of age, um, and immunocompromised individuals. Anyone who falls into those categories is recommended to receive prophylaxis if they were exposed. Also, household members of cases should receive prophylaxis. And then I'll note in Maine, Prophylaxis is rarely recommended to entire classrooms. Situations where it might be considered is if the classroom is at higher risk. We've had classrooms where individuals, the entire classroom was at high risk, um, where everyone was immune compromised. So in that case, yeah, we're gonna recommend it for the whole classroom. Um, if there was maybe a field trip, specifically a field trip where there was travel on a bus, or maybe they it was they slept away, then we might think about it a bit differently. But in general, prophylaxis won't be recommended for an entire classroom um, where there was a student with pertussis. All right, and then. I've mentioned outbreaks. And so outbreaks for us at Maine CDC are pretty clear cut. And I know it can be a bit ambiguous if you're not, I'm, we're, we haven't communicated what we're thinking of it as an outbreak. So I'm gonna share that. Um, so for us, a pertussis outbreak is three or more cases that are epidemiologically linked from different households. So that's an important point because a lot of times we'll see cases in the same household. So from different households where each patient's symptom onset is within 21 days of the previous case. So a field epidemiologist will be in contact with the school nurse when a school reaches outbreak. If we at Maine CDC see that, oh, we've had three cases that meet this criteria and they all attend this school. Um, 
So at that point, we'll reach out. But often, an outbreak, it's you all giving us a call and saying, hey, we have an outbreak, um, and reporting that to us. Um, but a field epidemiologist will also reach out to you if any pertussis patients that have been reported to us are determined to have been infectious, infectious while attending school. And so when they reach out, they'll also give the school letter so that you know, and it notifies everyone basically there's been a case of pertussis at your school. Um, so if you don't know and we know, we'll let you know. And then if you know and we don't know, or even if we do know, we definitely want to hear from you. So I hope that helps kind of clear up what we're thinking of as an outbreak. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not concerned if there is one case in the school or two cases in the school. Uh, we're still here to help. We're just not thinking at that point. We will not term it an outbreak at that point. Okay, now something that we noticed coming up a, a lot, especially last spring, was confusion between pertussis and paraprotussis. So I'm gonna say paraprotussis way more times than I would like during this slide, but here we go. So paraprotussis is often tested for when pertussis tests are run, they're run on a sort of panel together. Um, however, paraprotussis is not reportable. Um, the signs and symptoms, of paraprotussis are very similar to pertussis, but they're typically less severe um, and shorter. So pertussis, we're thinking someone might have a cough. It used to be known as the 100-day cough. So we're thinking of very long. It can be very severe. Paraprotussis is typically more mild. For paraprotussis, there are also no exclusion recommendations. There aren't any vaccines. Um, one thing we have run into is the confusion, not only around what's the difference between pertussis and paraprotussis, but we've gotten calls from individuals who thought they were diagnosed with pertussis, but it was paraprotussis. And I think a lot of that confusion can stem from um, the patient portals and seeing just the results written out if they haven't received a phone call yet from a provider, but they've seen that. Um, so if you receive a report and are unsure of it, um, or are like, it doesn't sound right, or generally if you receive a report, um, that's something that we can help clear up as well. But it's especially helpful if you're if you, for whatever reason, have some suspicion that it's actually paraprotussis, if you call that out when we're initially talking to you, that can be helpful. Um, our field epidemiologists can help uh, kind of go out and identify if it was pertussis or paraprotussis that was diagnosed. Um, let's see. So on to resources. There are lots of resources for you, and a lot of them were updated semi-recently within the last year. Um, so there's a lot more on the website than there used to be regarding pertussis. So if you haven't been there in a while, um, check it out. Uh, thanks to our health education team. Uh, but first, we'll start with the quick guide for schools. Um, I've included the links and I will send the slides to Sarah so you can use the links um, and have the slides. But this goes through methods of transmission, incubation period, signs and symptoms, uh, exclusion criteria, whether it needs to be reported to Maine CDC and prevention and control. Um, this also goes through um, these things for many diseases. Uh, so there's a long list of diseases you can get all this information for. And you're likely already familiar with this, but just a reminder that it is there. Um, there's also the school health, uh, manual and on the school health page, um, for each disease, there's a link to the fact sheet and the school health manual, as well as, um, in that left column with the disease information page, it'll bring you to the main CDC page for that disease. 
Um, so most, if not all of the main CDC information offered can all be accessed from that single page, um, which is helpful if you're looking for something and can't find it somewhere else. Okay. So more main CDC resources. We have on the left, the pertussis fact sheet. So you've likely seen one of these, if not for pertussis for another disease, we have them for, we try to have them for all diseases. Um, so this is the basics of pertussis. It can be helpful if you have, if you have an outbreak and people aren't super familiar with pertussis, it can be a nice sort of image based uh, pairing with the letter that goes out. Um, onto the middle image, we have the FAQ page on the website, which we also have a specific school specific FAQ, which was part of the update last year. Um, so there are lots of questions and lots of answers on this. Um, if you find yourself using it one day and think there's a question and the answer's not on here, uh, let us know. It's always great for us to know. We try our best to incorporate questions that we've gotten in the past on it um, to kind of make it one-stop shopping to get your protestants questions answered. Uh, but if it's not serving as that and there are questions you have that aren't there, we're more than happy to work on including them. Um, so let us know. And then finally on the right, I think the newest document is the pertussis versus paraprotussis um, sheet. This is also helpful for families. Again, if you if you get a call that a, a parent who doesn't understand the difference um, or is confused with the result, this can be a helpful sheet to refer them to. Um, again, we've gotten a lot of questions about this in the last year, so found that th this has been a helpful and pretty simple document to refer to um, when those questions come up. And then based on that, it links to uh, the general pertussis page. So if they have more in-depth questions, those are accessible, but also if it's a very basic, what's the difference, what is this? This kind of meets that need. Okay, we also have tons of orderable, orderable materials for you. So that these are, all um, nice poster or sheets um, that you can order on this, through this link, it's the DHHS orderable materials page. Um, there is a limit on how many you'll be able to order, um, but because you'll be ordering for a school, it is higher than what a household could get, um, just to note. So if you go on and it says like, you're limited to three, if you scroll down to the next one, it should be one for, um, I think it's labeled as businesses and you can get them through that. Um, but also if you're looking for just a quick printout and you don't need something um, that's like a professionally printed thicker card stock, if you're just looking for a printout, the PDFs are all accessible online uh, and you can either print or link to it from there, whatever is easiest for you. But we have the general just think pertussis sheet, um, the timeline that's very similar to the one we went over, and then the flu colds pertussis sheet. Um, this is helpful because again, respiratory season, it can be confusing. How would I know if it's this or that? Um, that's a good sheet to go to. All right. We also have new bookmarks, which are general, just um, wa hand washing uh, reminders, uh, which is great for the younger grades um, and maybe a fun thing you can keep in your office. So those are also on the orderable materials page um, if you want any. And then we have the US CDC has tons of resources. The page on the left is their general pertussis page. There is more information here than 
you'll find on the main CDC website. We try to tailor the information on the main CDC website to those who are most likely using it. But the US CDC website has information for clinicians, laboratorians, uh, people in public health, um, and the general public. So there's lots of information there. If you have something that's maybe a more specific question for whatever reason or interest. Um, and then on the right, you can see it's, I think it's a really helpful tool. It's the um, child and adolescent vaccine assessment tool. It's in a quiz format. It's a quick 10 questions. And when it results, it comes up with a list of all the vaccinations that that individual should have had at this point based on the age and how they fill out the answers to the questions. And then there are helpful notes next to each one. So if I can find my example for, um, for pertussis, let's see. So for Tdap, I filled it out as if it was a 17 year old and it's gonna come up with all the vaccines. Among these is Tdap and it will read, your child's age indicates they need this vaccine. One booster dose of tetanus diphtheria and pertussis vaccine, Tdap, is usually given at 11 through 12 years of age. Adolescents should be vaccinated if they haven't received a Tdap booster. And later booster doses of tetanus vaccine due every 10 years can either be TD or Tdap vaccine. So I think it's helpful, um, especially for parents who might be overwhelmed with what vaccines their kid has, what they don't have. It can serve as a nice checklist to go through. Yep, they've had that one. They've had that one. Um, of course, you know what the criteria are for the state, but I find that this can just generally be a helpful reference for fill it out, see what's recommended. It includes if a child is immunocompromised or they have a special condition, um, um, even if they've had a bone marrow transplant and might need to get revaccinated for certain things. So it's pretty comprehensive for how quick it is. And I find it includes a lot of information that people might have questions about, but might not always go looking for answers about. Um, so I think that can also be helpful. And that's all I have for you. I'm happy to take questions. And this is first my contact information and then the 800 number for the infectious disease consult line. And we also have an email address, uh, which is monitored during the day. I'll just note, please don't uh, include any patient health information in the messages. But other than that, those are all great resources of how to reach out to us. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. That's and awesome, Jessica. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, Thank I you. am gonna I'm gonna stop record just in case people feel more comfortable asking um, questions when not recording. So let me do that right now.